So today, um, I want to talk to you guys about something that, is, uh, that um, I'm really excited about. I want you to hear me today, and I don't want you to hear me negatively today. I want you to hear me positively, because uh, this is a positive message. It may come off a little hard, but it's positive. Uh, it's a positive message because I've been noticing something in the body of Christ. I've been, I've been noticing certain things, and not just in our fellowship, because I, I move around to a lot of, I, I go preach at other places, and I have brothers and sisters all over San Antonio, all over the United States, and even in different countries and stuff. And so <clears throat> I, I, I hear things from other brothers and sisters and stuff. I hear things, and, and, uh, and, and it, it, uh, it kind of alerts me to a condition that we are in today, and it's something that we can change. Can somebody say amen? amen. It's something that we can change, and I just want to alert you of it and, and, and give you some, something to chew on and think about as you go through your week. And um, it's something that the Lord like, kind of presented me and asked, he asked me the questions that I'm about to ask you. And it made me really think about who I am in Christ and what I do in Christ and what I think about being in Christ. And me, you know, I'm, I'm the preacher man, but the preacher man, you know, I sat down with the Lord too. Can I, can I share with you a dream I had? I had a, I had a dream. And it, it happened years ago. And... Um, and this kind of will introduce the message of be real quick. Um, I had a dream. I was walking into a white mansion, a white mansion, and everything in that place was white. And it had a, a beautiful staircase. It was, the floors were marble. It was just beautiful, man. It was a bone color white, like I like pearl white. I like pearl white. And so I walked in, and um, I was going through the whole house. And it was like, man, it was really neat. It was like everything in that house is what I like. And so I was walking up the stairs to check the upstairs, and I was looking in all the rooms, and one door of the house was locked, of the, of, of the upstairs was locked. And so I was like, hmm, that's locked. And then all of a sudden, I felt a presence next to me, a presence that I knew was the Lord, and he opened the door. And in the, door, in the room was two rocking chairs. Beautiful room, but in the room was two rocking chairs. And I sat in one, and he sat in the other, and we rocked for a little while and talked and different things. And then he pointed to a wall in the room. Now, when he pointed to that wall, I looked at the wall, and I didn't see it with my natural eyes, but I felt it. And everything on that wall was everything in my life that I was ashamed of, that I didn't never want to talk about, that hurt me, that damaged me, that all the bad things in my life was on that wall. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I kind of put my head down and he kind of lifted my head back up and he pointed to something on the wall in the left corner. And, and he said, how about that one? And I said, okay, and he waved his hand and it was gone. And I immediately felt it in my spirit. It was gone, boom. And boy, I felt so much joy when he did that. And then all of a sudden, I started pointing at all kinds of things on the wall. That, 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 that. You know, and he would just boom and he'd just boom and it'd be gone. It'd be gone. It, it was gone. It didn't affect me at all. I didn't feel it. I was just so happy. I was, I was filled with so much joy and love that I couldn't believe it. But then he pointed to the right side of the room, to the upper right hand corner, and he pointed at that. Everybody said that. He pointed at that. And he said, How about that one? And I said, I waited a few minutes and rocked, <laughs> and he rocked with me. He was just waiting because God is patient. Can somebody say amen? amen? And I told him, not that one. And so he got up out of the chair, and I got up. He walked towards the door. I walked towards the door, 
And we stood outside the door. He shut it, and he locked it, and he put the key in my hand and folded my hand up. And he looked at me and says, whenever you're ready to go back in, I'll be waiting for you. We've been back in that room many times. We're still going back in that room. But I want to tell you something today is that that experience is what God wants for us. The title of this message today is Made Alive But Living Dead. Okay. I want to walk you through it. The first portion of scripture we're going to read is in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 23. If you have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen. But if you have your Bibles, you can highlight it and underline it to go back and look at it later. Verse 21, it says, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Can somebody say amen? For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ at his coming. We as believers have a unique position in the world. We have moved from death to life. All other peoples on the face of the earth are dead. How is this possible? We see people moving around, taking jobs, making families, experiencing life to what they believe is the fullest. How can they be dead? The answer to answer this question is how we define death. We get that understanding from the one who created both life and death. If we look at the narrative that the father had with our forefathers, we can understand this most important concept. We see the conversation in Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. This is the encounter of what God told Adam before Eve came about. He gave Adam some instructions about being in the garden, and we start in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commended the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of God and good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Everybody say die. So to us, death means to cease to exist. We see people die every day, and since COVID, we have had seen people we love and close friends pass on. So we know what death is and what it looks like and feels like. However, if we look at the, at the utter fall of man, we see that known definition of death not make sense. In Genesis 3, after Adam and his wife Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, we see something happen and something that didn't happen. We see something that happened and something that didn't happen. Now, let's go back and read. Genesis 3, starting in verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband that was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. All right, we have a dilemma. 
They ate and didn't cease to exist. So the accepted definition of death is not in effect here. In other words, I, I can, you know, I know how Adam must have felt because he was right there. So Eve grabs, she's having a conversation with the serpent and she grabs it and he eats it and he's like, oh boy. Man, she going to bust that ground wide open. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> Nothing. He said, she didn't die. What, what happened? And, and he may have contemplated in his mind that maybe God was just keeping us from the tree because we weren't ready for the tree. Or maybe we're ready for the tree. She didn't die. She didn't hit the ground and roll up and turn to a ball and stop breathing. So he ate it. Or maybe because he didn't want to be separated from her. Because she, he knew at that moment she had disobeyed God. And he was thinking to himself, well, I don't want to be by myself. Maybe he was thinking that. Maybe I don't want to be by myself. Maybe it is better to be with her in disobedience than to be without her in obedience. So whatever his reasoning was, and I'm just interjecting here, he took it in eight. As we read uh, a, little, a little bit ago that he got the directions on, hey, you eat from this, you're going to die. He got the directions. Eve got it secondhand. There was no sin at this point, so physical death, not known or had any power. They never seen death. They don't know death. Death is not there. They're just living life. They don't even understand. They haven't seen anything die yet. Matter of fact, nothing had died. So all of a sudden, so when she partook of that fruit, when he partook of that fruit, death came into effect. But was it just physical? Well, well, yeah, we know now that the wages of sin is, everybody say it with me, death. I believe the text gives us two definitions of death. One is physical and the other one is separation. Everybody say separation. Separation from what, you might ask? The answer would be from God's near presence. Listen to me. They were separated from his near presence. Understand that the garden was created for a few reasons. Listen now. Whenever you think about the garden, I want you to think about it in five ways. Number one. The garden was a place of fellowship and intimacy with God and man. It was a place where he met with them in the cool of the day. He met with them. He came and he met with them. Matter of fact, when they had sinned and ran from him, they heard him coming. They heard him approaching them. They could hear him walking. They could feel his presence. They knew him. He fellowshiped with them. Matter of fact, every day he came at the same time. Why do I know that? Because at the same time, every day, it's the cool of the day. It's not a different time every day. It's not a different. He came every day. So he made that appointment. That was an appointment that he had with man at that time. Isn't that beautiful that God will come and meet with man? In a place where it was all good, it was peaceful, man. It was a place he created for fellowship. He made a garden and put man in there so he could go and be with man in that place. You got to see it, man. That, that, that was something really special for the father. It was a protected place. It was a place that was protected because man was given the ability to protect it. He, God said, guard this place, man. Take care of it because this is where we meet. Now, if it was a protected place, there had to be an enemy that could invade that place. 
So that place was protected. It was a protected place. It was a fortress kind of like. It was a set-apart place. Anybody got a place that they go that's protected? Anybody got a place they go where nobody else go beside the toilet? Some of you, it's your car on the way to work. It's protected. You, and you have your time with God in that car on that 40, 35, 40-minute 40 drive. Some of you ladies have to carry your makeup kit inside the car because you're weeping so much, you got to fix your face before you go to work. How many of y'all, how many, how many my sisters say amen? amen. The rest of y'all just don't want to admit it. It's a place of meaning, trust, and obedience. It's a place of favor where God gave man the ability to take control of his stuff. <laughs> you know, Adam named all the animals. God didn't name them. He said, Adam, name the animals, man. Whatever you call them, that's what going to be called. Yeah, you got dominion over the fish of the sea. I give you, I give you control over all of this stuff. Man, that's what God does. He fellowships with us. He, he does it in a protected place. Every time an angel showed up to deliver a message from God, he said, peace be still. The Lord be with you. Be still. This is a protected place. Moses, take your shoes off because you're on hollow ground. Protected place, a place of fellowship. Number four, a place of peace and the exercising of favor. Number five, a place that expressed truth, true life, as seen by the Father. It was true life because life was defined by God as being with him. Because when he said, on the day you eat from this, you will die. You will be separated from me. This place will no longer be what I made it to be for you and me. Your life, life as you know it, is with me and no one else. Adam didn't know any other life. Adam and Eve didn't know any other life but being with God. They were used to his presence. They were always in his presence. They were used to it. They didn't have another way of life. He said, but when, if you do decide you want to disobey, you will now experience a life without me. And he called that death. All right. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from the presence of the father that they experienced in the garden. This is the second meaning of death, separation from his near presence. Due to this outcome, they could no longer stay in his presence in a sinful state. So they were cast out of the garden. Genesis 3, 20 through 24. Now the man called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. If you're around a mother, look at her and say, you are of Eve. Yeah, because she was called Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. Wow. What a privilege, moms. What a privilege. Dads and children, let's give, let's give the Lord a praise for our moms, man. Wow. I tell you what, man. I watched my wife do that three times, and she's a superhero to me. You need to put a cape on her or something like that. That's some stuff delivering kids, boy. Mm. I mean, you I mean, you're talking about the incredible hawk. You ain't seen nothing. Verse 22, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch his hand out and take from the tree of life and live forever. Woo, you see the problem? Do you see the problem? Man had already sinned and died. What if he'd have reached out and ate from the tree? Could God have saved us? No. We would have ate from that tree and stayed like that, so then he would have had to judge us. 
with no chance of us ever being saved. So he kicked us out. He kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. Why did he kick them out of the garden? That's interesting. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim in a flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. Every direction it swung. Guarding the way of the tree did two things. It was to guard the tree and to remind Adam and Eve that the tree was still there. I'm going to guard this tree because if you guys eat from it, you're going to live in your sins forever. But I'm going to let you know that I got plans for this tree. You're going to see it again. Well, praise the Lord for the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we are no longer dead. Through Jesus, we, are, we now have a new and living way. Can somebody say amen? Amen. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, woo, which he inaugurated for us through, his, through the veil, that is his flesh. Pay attention to that because he's, he's doing a play on words. On the day that Jesus died and was crucified, There was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. Only one man could go in there one time a year, and it was the high priest. And it it separated the Holy of Holies from everything else. When Jesus Christ was being crucified, when he gave up the ghosts and said, it is finished, that veil was torn from the top all the way to the bottom. In other words, God says, there's no separation between us anymore. I don't don't know about y'all, but I'm so happy about that. And what he is saying in Hebrews is that when that veil got torn, it was a representation of Jesus being torn. What happened in the temple was actually happening on the cross. God was sending a message. When he says it is finished, the stelethi, it is finished. When it was finished, what was finished? What had happened in the garden was finished. When man was kicked out, God says, all right, I can bring man back in. So the veil was ripped. So no longer God said, hey, man, ain't no separation between me and man no more. I can have what I always wanted. Jesus gave up the ghost. Veil was written, was torn in half. God said, now, told the cherubim, stop swinging that sword. The tree of life. Is now available for everyone who will believe. God, you got to see it. So he says this is a new and living way. Why? Because the dead people who didn't know his near presence have been invited back into his near presence. We have been invited back to be with him. Every day, just like Adam and Eve had, we get to know what they knew. We get to feel what they felt. We get to meet with him in the cool of the day. I advise you, man. I encourage you. Come out here at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, man. Out there in the amphitheater, just sit out there. You'll feel God walking around out there in the cool of the day. He walking around out there. He like that amphitheater. He love it. You go sit out there and say, Lord, I'm alive in you. Can you come and be with me for a while out here? Blow your mind. Every time we come out here, we'll see you sitting out there. Because once you get into his presence, once he brings you back into his presence, you're made alive again. That means now you can be with him. The sin debt has been paid that separated us from him. So now you can be with him. You can be with him. Say that with me. You can be with him. I, I'm, oh, man, understand this. God's not far from you. Okay. That's some exciting stuff. 
Notice it said a new and living way. This way is a way that returns us back to the life through the sacrifice of the one named Jesus. Through him, I not only have life, but abundant life. What does that mean? Here is what Jesus said about this type of life. He called it abundant. It's John 10, 9 through 10. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. Why? Because everyone was dead and have it abundantly. He just redefined what we know life to be again. Not just life. Okay, you know life is breathing, existing. He says, I want to introduce to you what I call life. Abundant life. So what does that word abundant mean? That word means preeminence, fame, or recognition of superiority. I come to give you a superior life. Not just a regular life. See, because what I've, what I've done right now, what I've opened up is for you for the first time, for any other human being except for those two to feel and know my near presence. What is that presence like? It's abundant. It's superior, man. It's awesome. It's, a, it's, a, it's an advantageous position. It's more remarkable. It's more excellent. It's more good. Everybody just say more. It's just more. More than what you got right now. See, here's the thing, right? Everybody always talk about supernatural. God is asking us to live above the natural. That's what supernatural is. Live above the natural. He's giving us the power to live above the natural. Yeah. What does that mean? That means now that as I walk in this earth, I am not dead. I'm alive. What does that mean? That means everywhere I put my feet, my Father is with me, 24 hours a day. I have a chance now not to live a normal dead life. Matter of fact, everybody that I'm around get to feel this abundant life. They get to feel it. They get to feel life. Woo-wee, I love dead people. Because when I get around them, I want to love on them. I want them to feel life coming from me. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. If, you, if you're around Pastor TC at any time and you got dead stuff rolling around in you, oh, man, I'm going to breathe on you, try to bring you back to life. And hope I'm chewing gum when I do it. It's all about being alive, man. It's not being dead. We live these dead lives, man. If God call us to be super doctor, we let everything, we let all this stuff in the world convince us we're not alive, but we're dead. We do it every day. We're in this presence. Wait a minute. I, the same presence that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. The God that made the heavens and the earth and raised the sun up and changed the seasons is my friend. I cannot believe this. You want me to be a friend? Do you know me? Yeah, I know you. <laughs> I know you. I know where you came from. I know your mom. I know your mama's mama. I know your mama, mama, mama. I know your mama's mama, mama. I know all of them. I know. I still want you. I mean, I want you to be with me. I want you to be in my presence. I want you to be alive. <sighs> so the only life that we have heard of that relates to this definition is what they experienced in the garden. So we are invited to a life that Jesus himself built for us that none of us have ever known. He, you never, we've never known this kind of life. We've never known what it is to be loved unconditionally. We've never known what it is to walk through fire and walk through water and he be with us. We're not, we don't understand why we keep bouncing back time after time after time because that's that abundant life that he's drawn us back into. And he says, come on, live it. Come on, live it with me. Let me live it through you. Yeah, 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 I know you're going to go through stuff. I didn't take you out of life. I left you in it so that me and you can show the world what it is to be with me. 
Isn't that exciting, man? So why do so many people feel they are so far from the Lord? Why do people who call themselves Christians struggle so hard with being in his presence? Maybe it's because we are living as though we're dead. I'm going to make a couple statements, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to go. just want you to think about them. If you're doing anything right now, stop it. I want you to listen to what I'm saying right here. I want you to listen what the man of God is saying to you right now. Listen to it. The Lord is going to speak to every one of your hearts concerning what I'm going to say next. Please listen. This is important. Many Christians do not understand the issue in the garden was about holiness and purity. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, their conscience mind became aware of sin. So they ran from the purity of the father. Listen to me closely. When you're in his presence, this is why I told you the dream I had at the beginning. When you're in his presence, he cleanses your conscience because you are walking with him. He understands and he knows the things that have been done and what has happened. And he understands you can't believe or walk with him because your conscience has condemned you for so long. You can't believe that you can live free. So he is constantly trying to cleanse our consciences. And he's trying to do it in a way that would flood and wash it out. And we fight it because cleansing a conscience does not look pretty. It is very, very aggressive. But he is kind and he is good. But he's after your conscience being clean so that you can live in confidence with him. So what he says to you, you will believe. What he means to do for you, you will accept. What he means to walk you through, you will submit to because your conscience is not condemning you. Number two, many believers do not see themselves as being separated unto God. And doing so would be showing indifferent to others. Intimacy, look, look, I'm separated from every other female on the face of the earth. Why? Because I'm only intimate with one. I'm not intimate with a bunch of women. That's called adultery. I'm not interested in being intimate with anybody else. I got the one. And that one is the key to me. That is the only one that I want to be intimate with. Now, everybody else are sisters from other misters. (laughs) But they don't, they cannot be and will not be and not even thought to be as I am with that lady, Mrs. Christian, the only one in this whole building that has seen me naked and is okay with it. (laughs) Intimacy. God is saying, I want that intimacy with me and you. The garden you in is about me and you, not me and other gods. And everything that comes again, that gets in the middle of that is idolatry to me. And I need you to separate yourself from anything that would make yourself believe it's a God in your life. Because I'm bringing you back in the garden for intimacy, for fellowship, for favor. Number three. Some Christians do not agree with being separated and deny anything that the scriptures or other Christians say about it. They call it legalism. Okay, I'm going to address this very briefly. Pastor said it like this, said in two ways. He said, you are as close to God as you want to be. No, I'm 
That's between you and him. You are, you are as close to God as you want to be. As you want to be. And I find it funny that people who talk about legalism in their walk with God will, will accept legalism in every other walk of their life. I find it funny that when somebody is devoted to God in a way that shows they may love him more than you do, they may be looked at as legalists. And there is a such thing as legalism. Don't get me wrong. I think it's just another definition of religion, being religious. But I'm here to tell you that because of that word and that concept, a lot of holiness and a lot of purity and a lot of separation has been negated because it has been looked at as something that it's not. Be careful with that. Be very, very careful with that. Number four. Some Christians have a false sense that everything that they do is okay because he loves me. So sanctification is not pursued but avoided. Please be careful with that. The heart is desperately wicked. Somebody finish it. Who can know it? I don't even know my own heart. I don't even know what I'm capable of at certain situations. So I have to make sure I guard my heart and check it. I have to make sure that I'm right before God, even when I come and talk to you. As you know, sometimes I heard a pastor say this one time. It was so funny. He said right before he came up on the platform, it was a big argument in the back between his deacons. And so he was trying to handle that situation. And when he got up on the platform, he was so disturbed, he kept telling the, 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 the worship leader, he kept saying, oh, let's sing that song again, praise God. He was trying to get himself together because he couldn't take what was out there and splat it out here. He had to make sure his heart was right before he spoke from this place right here. Because this place is hollow. It is holy. We are held responsible. Sanctification is necessary when you allow God to cleanse you from dead works. When you're alive, you do things that are living. When you're dead, you do things that are dead. So sanctification closes the door on dead works and gives you an idea and a feeling and 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 your conscience is right before God. Sanctification is his ability and his job to set us apart from dead things. Are you hearing me today? Sanctification doesn't happen by you. It happens by him. You submit to it and allow that process to make you whole, make you well. Cleanse you from dead works, dead activity. Things that don't come from your fellowship and your intimacy with him. Most are very ignorant of how to approach the Lord because they do not know his heart. So they think he is like a man. God is not a man. He is not a man. He is a spirit. He became a man so that he could sacrifice himself so that he can bring us back in. God is not a man. And people are ignorant or very afraid of him because they think because a man did something to them that he's going to do the same thing. That's a lie. Nunca, nunca. He is not like a man. He is a father, a loving God. He loves us, man. He's not going to treat us like our earthly fathers did. He's not going to abandon us like our friends did. He's not going to leave us in a place where we're destroyed or disgruntled. Or He's not going to do that. Cain, man, was mad, angry, and God took the time to talk to him. Cain, listen to me. You're about to get in big trouble because your attitude is messed up. 
I want to talk to you about what sin wants to do to you. That's a loving father. He could have just wasted Cain right there so Abel's life would not be given. But he didn't. He talked to him like a father, knowing what he was about to do. Sometimes God speaks to our hearts, knowing what we're going to do. Because he loves us and he wants us to see it, not have to be made to do it. And some of us don't understand that because we're so, we're so wounded, we're so broken, we're so beat up that we don't, we look at God just like we looked at the person that did that to us. And the last one I want you to think about. Some Christians have the notion because they do works for the Lord, they are close to him. But their lives outside of works tell a different story. Sometimes we do things and we think that will fix the ledger. But God's not looking at a ledger. He wants intimacy. He wants you. He wants your heart. Yeah, all of that's good. But are y'all walking in that room and sitting down in that rocking chair and dealing with some things? Because that's what he really wants to do. Anybody can serve God doing things, but very few people can walk with him in the cool of the day. And that's what he desires more than anything else. The Bible says Israel knew God's hands, but Moses knew God's heart. And he called Moses his friend. There was a situation where Aaron and Miriam and Moses was arguing. And Aaron and Miriam, which is his brother and sister, they had a problem with the Ethiopian woman he married, which was Zipporah, which he took for a wife when he was in Midian. So they was upset about him marrying her because she was not a Jew. She was not from their line. And they were talking to him and they were arguing back and forth. And Miriam said, we hear from God, too. You're not the only one. So, man, God came down and he called them out of the tent. <laughs> he came, came down and called them out. So all three of them came out. And he talked to all three of them. He said, look, when I speak to a prophet, I do it in dreams and visions. He said, but not so with Moses. I speak to him face to face like a friend. He said, why were you not afraid of speaking against my friend? He gave Miriam leprosy, just like that. Moses fell out and looked, be quiet. Take her out to camp. You know what to do for her. We'll bring her back in. The only reason Aaron didn't get it, because he was a high priest. The Lord doesn't want our hearts to disqualify us from his presence. So he is constantly wanting to deal with the heart. He is constantly wanting to bring us close so he can wash us from all of that. You never, I don't care what you did, you can never put shame on the Lord. He is wanting you to come to him. He says that he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because the garden has been reestablished again. It's not about sin anymore. Sin has been dealt with. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not in that garden anymore. It's been dealt with. So now God is in the cleansing fellowship business. But he wants you to believe that you're tight enough with him that you can come to him with that thing and say, Lord, this is what I've done. He said, I know I saw it. I saw it on the cross when you did it. But I've been waiting for you to bring it to me so we can get rid of it. So we can be tight. Because that thing is keeping you away from me. So 
So, these are but a few reasons why people forfeit the near presence of the Father and live dead. This is not God's intent at all. We end with the portion of Scripture that we started with, Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 23. If you can stand to your feet this afternoon, this morning, excuse me. Some of y'all feel like it's afternoon. Okay. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Everybody say, draw near. near. With a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of, of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen, man. Amen. Father, we love you today. We thank you for all you did for us at Calvary. Not just for salvation, but that you opened up a new and living way. That we no longer would have to live outside of your presence that we can live now in your presence. Because the thing that kept us away from you, you dealt with all by yourself. You opened the door for us to come in and live alive, to live an abundant, superior, excellent, favorable life. That we no longer live dead, but live as though we are alive. walk with you in the cool of the day. You, every, not just in a place that, that you establish that you call a garden, but in every place we are with you is the garden. Everywhere we go when we call on your name, when you call us, we will answer. When you, we call you, you will hear us. Thank you for this new and living life that we have. Help us not to live dead. Help us to live alive in you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters right now that are listening. That Father, you would show them like you showed me. Things that kept me from living alive. Reveal to them so that they may bring them to you and that you may wash their conscience clean. That, Father, they will no longer live afraid or live in shame. For you have made a way that you called a living way for us to be with you. Let all the anger cease. Let all the hatred and the violence and unforgiveness, which are dead things, no longer be part of our lives so that we can live in truth, live in love, walk in love, walk in the truth. Love like we've never loved before because now we're loving free. Do it for us, Lord, because you are able. You are the lover of our souls. Even when I don't even love myself, you love me. Even when I look down on myself, you tell me, those are wrong thought patterns, son. I have freed you from the curse of the law. I became a curse so that you may have life. Live free in me. Everything that bothers you, everything that disrupts you, everything, bring it to me and we will deal with it because I have prepared a way for you. Don't walk in the broad way, walk in the narrow way because the narrow way is the new and living way. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for the work you did, for the work you're doing, 
for the work you're going to do. Thank you, Spirit, Holy Spirit, for revealing the Father's heart to us, leading us and teaching us. Help us not ignore the things that you're showing us. And we'll be careful to stay in that place because that's where you fellowship with us. That's where we feel your presence. And we will weep, we will be with you in the cool of the day. Though the storms may rage and trouble may come, I will be at rest in my Father who is my peace. We give you all the praise, Lord. Let this message, Lord, work its way into the heart, my brothers and sisters. I know it's a lot to eat, but Father, make their plates bigger. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of hurting souls. But the souls in here have to be free before they can shine the light on others. Do your work in a special way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you get a lot of praise in this house today, man?